Good evening, and welcome to another in the Monday night lecture series of the College of Architecture and Planning. Uh, we're very privileged tonight to have one of the distinguished educators in the planning field with us, Dr. John F. Kane of the Graduate School of Design, Harvard University. Dr. Kane is the chairman of the Department of City and Regional Planning there and is a professor of economics at Harvard. He's had a long and distinguished career. He was uh, born in Fort Wayne, Indiana. He's a native Hoosier. Received his Bachelor of Arts degree from Bowling Green State University uh, in 1957 with honors in both economics and political science. Uh, he then studied at the University of California at Berkeley, receiving his MA and his PhD. He's had a wide range of professional experience. Uh, he's been a consultant uh, on the White House panel on civilian technology, a consultant to the Denver Research Institute at the University of Denver, member of the MIT Harvard Joint Center for Urban Studies, consultant to the RAND Corporation, uh, consultant to the U.S. General Accounting Office, and currently is a senior staff member with the National Bureau of Economic Research. Dr. Kane, in 1965, uh, along with uh, John Meyer and Martin Wohl, uh, published a book called The Urban Transportation Problem, which has become a classic in the literature of planning and transportation. In recent years, he's turned his attention to housing and racial discrimination. And in 1975, with John M. Quigley, published a book entitled Housing Markets and Racial Discrimination, a Microeconomic Analysis. Also in 1975, he edited a book of, of essays on urban spatial structures. It was a very great pleasure for me to welcome John Kane back to Indiana, and uh, it's a privilege for us to have him here with us tonight. And without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. John F. Kane. Thank you, David. Uh, let's see if I can get this mic uh, to the right level. It's always a great uh, pleasure to return home uh, and uh, have an opportunity to see the changes that uh, have taken place. It's probably been 20 years, or uh, a little bit longer, since I've been to Muncie, Indiana. I've been to Fort Wayne, Indiana, uh, to visit family and so on in that period. It's probably been over 20 years since I've seen Muncie and seen Ball State. And I must admit, I'm quite impressed uh, with the kind of, of progress that Ball State has, has, uh, has made over the two decades or so uh, since I've been here. I must admit, though, I'm a little bit disturbed uh, as a uh, graduate of Bowling Green State University by the progress it seems to be making in its athletic program uh, uh, during the same period. The, uh, my, my, the subject of my remarks tonight are, in fact, a little bit unfashionable. If we had been meeting, say, five, six, seven years ago at the height of the so-called urban crisis, at the time of the riots in Watts uh, uh, and uh, in Detroit, other such places, uh, uh, the, my remarks would have, been, have seemed more pertinent uh, would have, in fact, uh, have been uh, uh, very, very topical and current at the time. Now, even having said that, though, I think that the burden of what I have to say tonight, as, you'll be, as it will become clear, uh, is that the underlying causes of discrimination, particularly housing market discrimination, which uh, created the sort of uh, social and moral crisis uh, a, a six or eight years ago, uh, are very much still with us today. 
Uh, as I'll, as I'll uh, indicate, there have been some signs of progress. There are even some more uh, hopeful signs in a certain regards. But uh, the, uh, the urban crisis remains with us. And the urban crisis, uh, much as it was uh, five to six years ago, is in fact a crisis, a crisis of race and racial discrimination. Now this evening what I plan to do is to discuss the adverse effects of racial discrimination in the urban housing market and outline a number of programs and policies that would ameliorate these effects in the short run and would help eradicate racial discrimination and segregation in the long run. My emphasis tonight reflects my assessment that housing market discrimination is the linchpin that holds together the web of discriminatory practices that limit the opportunities and achievements of black Americans. At the same time, I must claim that black Americans must accept the share of, res of the responsibility for the recent lack of progress in reducing segregated living patterns and in eliminating discriminatory practices in urban housing markets. During the 1950s, there was nearly universal agreement among black leaders about the desirability, indeed the necessity of achieving racial integration in housing and indeed in all facets of American life. Then in the 1960s, a black separatist ethos began to assert itself, which in varying degrees rejected integration as a goal and proposed social and economic separatism and the economic development of the ghetto as an alternative. Now, to a substantial extent, the rejection, rejection of integration as a goal resulted from the disillusionment of many black leaders who dissatisfied with what they perceive as lack of progress and embittered by what they viewed as broken promises, concluded there must be a better way. Thus, many black leaders and intellectuals turned away from, or at minimum became uncertain about integration and particularly residential integration as a goal. Without the moral backing of black leaders, many white proponents of integration wavered as well, and their places were filled by white advocates of black economic development and black power. Now, throughout the ensuing debate, I have remained convinced that the elimination of housing market discrimination and the realization of circumstances where blacks may, if they wish, leave the ghetto is the best and perhaps the only way in which black Americans can hope to achieve economic and social equity or equality with white Americans. Now, blacks have made somewhat larger gains in the job market. This greater progress in part reflects less opposition by the white majority to equal employment opportunity, but it also re reflects a lesser conflict between equal employment policies and the black power, black nationalist, and ghetto economic development rhetoric. Equal opportunity in housing, the suburbanization of the black population, destruction of the ghetto, or integration in housing, in contrast, collided head on with black power, black, black uh, nationalism, and separatist ideologies. Central to all of these concepts is the idea of turf. The black ghettos of our cities became something to be protected efforts to provide black households with the opportunity to purchase or rent housing in the wider metropolitan housing market were seen as many black and white proponents of black power and ghetto economic development as divisive efforts to weaken the economic, political, and moral strength of the black population. In parallel with and in response to the political ideology of black power and black separatism, economic analysis emerged that depicted the ghetto as a suppressed colony and attempted to apply the analytical techniques borrowed from de development economics to the problems of the ghetto. It was natural then to propose economic development of the ghetto as a means to improve the economic circumstances of the black population, especially since this approach was perceived as generally supportive of the black power orientation. At least two different kinds of rationale were used to justify black economic development programs. The first supported black power and black economic development as an interim or temporary strategy to be pursued until black Americans achieved economic parity with whites. Only after the economic basis of social discrimination had been eliminated, it was argued, would, wha would blacks and whites be able to participate as equals in a pluralistic society. It was understood by the proponents of this strategy 
that might take decades for blacks to achieve economic equality through ghetto economic development. But many argued that true equality could only be achieved in this way. Now, a second group of advocates perceived ghetto economic development in different terms. Rather than something that would, be, that would wither away, they argued in favor of the development of distinct and separate economic and political institutions in the long run. Now, my objective tonight is not primarily to uh, evaluate these black power and black and ghetto economic development proposals. I merely provide them to you as background uh, to the general sort of intellectual ferment and the general sorts of, uh, of pressures and moral pressures that exist in society. My discussion tonight instead begins with a review of the findings of economists and other social scientists on the extent of racial segregation of its, on its causes and its impact on the welfare of black and white Americans. This survey will reveal that housing market discrimination imposes more numerous and larger costs on black Americans as is popularly understood and strongly supports the conclusion that we should renew our commitment to equal opportunity in housing and make increased efforts to obtain for black Americans the same access to metropolitan housing markets as white Americans. Finally, I will consider a number of policies that would ameliorate the effects of racial discrimination in the urban housing market and foster its eventual eradication. Now, any discussion of the effects of racial discrimination on the behavior of urban housing markets and on the welfare of black Americans should begin with a clear understanding of the extent and nature of residential segregation prevalent today in American cities. Now, this, pro this proposition may seem self-evident to a number of you, but I've had experience in discussing this uh, subject over the years, and it's made it clear that it's undesirable to proceed without a clear statement of the available evidence on this point. An important aspect of housing market segregation is a token representation of Negroes in suburban areas. Black Americans have not participated in the rapid post-war suburbanization of the population. Unfortunately, there's more than a germ of truth in the characterization of an increasingly black central city strangled by a noose of white suburbs. For example, in 1970, the last date for which there are comprehensive data available, 12% of the 216 metropolitan areas in the United States were Negro. However, 21% of central city populations were black is contrasted with only 5% of suburban population. Worse yet, housing market segregation does not end with the exclusion of blacks from suburban areas because Negroes are also intensely segregated within central cities. Now, numerous explanations have been offered for the virtual segrega total segregation of blacks. One of the most common is the contention that Negroes are concentrated within particular neighborhoods because they are poor, spend too little on housing, or differ systematically from the majority white population in terms of other characteristics that affect the choice of residence. Now, this socioeconomic hypothesis is easily evaluated empirically, and several studies have examined it. Without exception, these studies have determined that only a fraction of the observed pattern of Negro residential segregation can be explained by low incomes of or other measurable socioeconomic differences between the white and black population. Although many tests of the socioeconomic hypothesis rely on elaborate statistical methods, even the most primitive analyses are, are sufficient to raise serious doubts about it. If low income explains the concentrations of Negroes in central cities, it should also be true that most low income whites live in central city and that most of the small middle class, Negro middle class, live in the suburbs. Yet, as, as, as published census data illustrate, almost as many low-income whites live in the suburban rings of our largest metropolitan areas as live in our central cities. For example, 52% of Detroit's poor white families live in its suburbs, but only 11% of its poor Negro families. In fact, the proportion of low-income whites living in Detroit's suburbs is not very different uh, from the proportion of all whites. The situation is completely different for Negroes. Relatively few high income, and by that I mean black families with incomes of above $10,000 in 1970, 
relatively few high-income Negroes live in the suburbs. Indeed, in uh, the 11 largest metropolitan areas, the percentage of high-income Negroes living in suburban areas is considerably less than that of the lowest-income whites. For example, in Cleveland, only 20% of high-income Negroes live in the suburbs as compared with 80% of high-income whites and 66% of, lo of low-income whites. Clearly, income is not the explanation for the underrepresentation of high-income Negroes in suburban housing markets. Another explanation holds that segregation of, of the segregation of Negroes is a result of a desire for, by them to live, quote, with their own kind, and that, that this is, quote, a normal and healthy, unquote, manifestation of a pluralistic society. The immigrant colonies that are evident even today in many cities are cited as evidence of the normality of this behavior. Now, it's true that a number of identifiable ethnic and nationality groups have exhibited some degree of segregation in American cities. However, the difference between their experience and that of the American Negro is so marked as to invalidate this historical analogy. The intensity of Negro residential segregation is greater than that documented for any other identifiable subgroup in American history. Moreover, while the segregation of these other groups has declined over time, that of the Negro has remained at a high level and possibly even increased. Finally, metropolitan areas are very different places than they were 30 or 50 years ago when the ethnic colonies flourished. They are far less compact and employment is far more dispersed. These widely scattered employment centers impose heavy co commuting costs on many ghetto residents. No comparable disincentives existed when the ethnic colonies flourished. To conclude that voluntary self-segregation is, is responsible, therefore, for much of the current pattern of Negro residential segregation, it is necessary to assume that Negroes have much stronger ties to their community than other groups. Although there is evidence, or there has been evidence, of a growing cultural pride and a sense of community among blacks in recent years, it's impossible to assign much weight to this explanation uh, for the durable segregation patterns in American cities. Recognizing the difficulties of interpretation, recent surveys of Negro attitudes provide little support for the self-segregation hypothesis. For example, 68% of a random sample of U.S. Negroes interviewed by the Harris Poll in 1966 indicated a preference for living in integrated uh, uh, neighborhoods. Two-thirds of the Negroes interviewed in the Harris Poll a preference for integrated neighborhoods. Similarly, the same poll uh, reported only 17% uh, of Negroes indicated a preference for all black neighborhoods. The fraction of northern Negro Negroes was even smaller, 8% in the same year, and the fraction of middle up and upper income residents in the north was still smaller yet, 6%. 6% of upper and middle income uh, blacks at essentially the height of the urban crisis responded to questions about their preferences for living in integrated and segregated neighborhoods, indicating that they preferred not to live, uh, only 6% preferred an indication, preferred living in all black neighborhoods. In spite of any lack of systematic evidence which supports the self-segregation hypothesis, it's virtually impossible to dispose of. The problem is that it is virtually impossible to determine finally the role of self-segregation as long as strong traces of majority, by that I mean white, antagonism toward the Negroes' efforts to leave the ghetto remain. The physical dangers of moving out of the ghetto are probably less today than in the past, but many subtle and indirect forms of intimidation and discouragement still exist. Evidence of the methods to enforce housing market discrimination is more difficult to obtain today than in the past. Open occupancy laws which, which forbid discrimination in the, sale, in, in the sale and rental housing on the basis of race and a clear-cut in a, a decline in clear-cut community approval for such practices have caused the opponents of open housing to resort to more subtle and secretive methods. This is an entirely new situation. 
Until very recently, the most important devices used to enforce segregation could hardly be called subtle. Deed restrictions, racial covenants, the appraisal practices of the Federal Housing Administration and private lending institutions, the actions of local officials, and the practices of real estate agents were among the most important of these instruments. Because residential patterns have a great deal of inertia, the effect of these now discredited devices will long be felt. Even if there were no future resistance to Negro efforts to leave the ghetto, the cumulative effect of decades of intense discrimination will have long-lasting impacts. If these inimical patterns of housing market segregation are to be destroyed, strong laws, vigorous enforcement, and powerful incentives will be necessary. In determining the range of corrective action, both needed and justified, it is important to recognize the extent of discriminatory actions and particularly the complicity of government and law. At the same time, it should be understood that the most essential ingredient is the strong moral leadership by black leaders and intellectuals and the support of the entire black community for those black pioneers who leave the ghetto to seek greater opportunity for themselves and their children in a strange and often hostile environment. All too often, Today, they instead must combat the suspicions and hostility of the black community as well. Now, any discussion of the welfare losses imposed on blacks by racial discrimination in the urban housing market should, be should distinguish between those costs associated with housing consumption and those due to limitations on residential location. Insofar as economists have considered housing market discrimination at all, they have generally asked only whether housing market discrimination causes black households to pay more than white households for identical housing bundles or identical bundles of housing services. Now, it turns out that the definitive answer to even this very simple question, or apparently simple question, has proved elusive because of the inherent methodological difficulties it involves. There is now a general agreement, however, that blacks typically, or at least until very recently, paid more than whites uh, for the same housing bundle. The best uh, and, and most comprehensive study of price discrimination uh, in uh, urban housing markets is by Robert Gillingham using census data from the 1960 census and Bureau of Labor Statistics data from 1961. The Gillingham study provides the best and most systematic uh, evidence of the magnitude of, of discrimination uh, markups for rental housings. Gillingham studied 10 large metropolitan areas in 1960 and found this evidence of discrimination markups in all but one San Francisco. Now, Gillingham's evidence for 1960 are consistent with earlier investigations based on aggregate census data by Richard Muth for Chicago and by Ritker and Henning for St. Louis, and by numerous others. Indeed, of the large number of studies that have examined the problem of housing market discrimination, and particularly the existence or non-existence of discrimination markups, only two, one by Martin Daly, dealing with the ownership market in the south side of Chicago, and another by Victoria Lampton, uh, dealing with Houston, only these two find no evidence of discrimination markups. The methodological difficulties of Bailey's studies are too numerous for me to discuss at this point, although I'll be willing to talk about it later if you like. Uh, those of Lampin's, on the other hand, are obvious. Lampin considered no neighborhood characteristics, even though Gillingham's and num numerous other studies have shown neighborhood characteristics to be as important as structure attributes in determining housing prices and rents. Now, there is some reason to believe that these discrimination markups, and by discrimination markups, we're talking about the percentage difference between the amount that uh, blacks have to pay for housing and whites pay for housing. So if we talk about a discrimination markup of 10%, we're saying that blacks pay 10% more for comparable housing, for identical housing units, than whites. Now, there's some reason to believe that these discrimination markups, which were identified by Gillingham and others during the 60s, may have declined somewhat in the past 13 years 
as the rate of growth of the urban black population has declined. However, analyses by King and Myskowski for New Haven and John Quigley and me using more recent data for St. Louis indicates that comparable and still very large differentials exist. The king myskowski study obtained discrimination markups that vary between 13 and 22 percent for rental households in New Haven in the period 1968 to 69. Reviewing these studies generally, discrimination markups appear to be higher in areas with larger and more rapidly growing black populations and in those areas where black populations are restricted, more most intensely restricted to the central city. Now, while discrimination markups of the order of magnitude that we've been talking about, we're talking about markups of any place from 5 to 25 percent, represent a serious welfare loss for black Americans, they in fact are only the tip of the iceberg. Nearly all available estimates of discrimination markups implicitly assume that housing is a homogeneous good and that housing in the ghetto is the same as housing outside the ghetto, except for its price. In fact, housing is a bundle of heterogeneous attributes, and the characteristics of housing bundles available in the ghetto differ from those available in the rest of the metropolitan housing market. Finally, the discrimination markups of these numerous housing bundles are not uniform. Using the methodology obtained in earlier, or used in earlier studies, John Quigley and I obtained discrimination markup estimates of 5% for owner-occupied units in St. Louis in 1967 and 9% for rental units. But when we considered and took into account the heterogeneity of housing markets, the estimated price discrimination markups proved to be much larger. Our analysis revealed that the typical ghetto rental unit could be obtained for 13% less in an all-white area. Subsequent analysis by John Yinger, using the same uh, data that Quigley and I used, uh, but uh, uh, using a more correct uh, kind of specification, has obtained even larger uh, estimates of the discrimination markup. Now, worse yet, many desirable housing bundles are either very scarce are completely unavailable in the ghetto. To consume these desirable kinds of housing, Negro households have to seek housing in neighborhoods not sanctioned for Negro occupancy. There, without guarantee of success, they must devote inordinate amounts of time and money to house hunting, subject themselves and their families to uh, humiliation and harassment. As a result, most blacks limit their search for housing to the ghetto. Housing market discrimination thus operates to restrict black access or to limit black access to the newest and highest quality housing in, best, in, in the best neighborhoods. That is, housing market discrimination prevents them from acquiring these better, more desirable kinds of housing. And it's hardly surprising as a result that black households consume less of both neighborhood and dwelling unit quality and exterior space and spend less on housing than would be predicted from a knowledge of their incomes and other household characteristics. These same supply restrictions ensure that blacks are less likely to be homeowners than white households of similar income and family structure. For example, John Quigley and I found that while only 18% of black households in Chicago in 1960 were homeowners, 47% would have been homeowners in the absence of housing market discrimination. 17% of black households in Chicago were homeowners. 47%, nearly half, would have been homeowners in the absence of, mark, of housing market discrimination. Similar differences were obtained for 17 other large metropolitan areas included in our research. The differences, be, these differences between actual and expected black ownership rates, home ownership rates, in the 18 large metropolitan areas included in our study, turned out to be systematic related to the extent to which the central city contained units suitable for, home or, for owner occupancy uh, and the extent of black access uh, to the suburban housing market. And just to give you a sort of illustration of that, uh, the difference between actual black home ownership rates and what you would predict from a knowledge of their income, family composition, and the like, uh, 
The difference is much smaller in Los Angeles than it is in Chicago. To think about it a little bit, it's clear why that's the case. In the ghetto housing market in Los Angeles is heavily, if not predominantly, single family units. How uh, Watts is a single family ghetto. There are units that are suitable, appropriate, convenient for home ownership. Uh, and so the different, on the other hand, the ghetto in Chicago, for those of you who have journeyed up to uh, the Windy City, uh, the ghetto in Chicago is heavily concentrated in high density uh, neighborhoods with uh, dense, dense multifamily housing that are not appropriate or suitable for home ownership. The, 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 the part of the, the, the Chicago ghetto that is suitable for home ownership is a very small part. The result is the supply, the restriction of supply operates differentially uh, in Los Angeles uh, in the, and in Chicago. And if you look across metropolitan areas, it'll, it turns out that that factor, plus the extent to which blacks have managed to get access to the suburban housing market, explains most of the, diff most of the gap, most of the difference in the gap across metropolitan areas. Now, these restrictions on Negro home ownership I've just referred to have far greater ramifications than may be evident at first glance. An effective limitation on home ownership can increase Negro annual housing outlays by over 30%, assuming no price appreciation. Moreover, given reasonable assumptions about increases in housing prices, a Negro household prevented from buying a home 20 years ago would have out-of-pocket housing costs today that are more than twice as high as their costs would have been if they'd been able to purchase their home 20 years earlier. These increases or differences in housing costs are in addition to the kinds of differences attributable to discrimination markups that I talked about previously. Now, of course, much of the savings from home ownership results from the favorable treatment according home homeowners under the federal income tax. As all of you know, you can deduct your interest payments, you can deduct your property taxes, and you don't have to pay tax on imputed rent. Now, since Negro households at all income levels are impeded by housing market discrimination from purchasing and owning single-family homes, they are prevented from taking full advantage of these tax benefits. The loss of tax benefits is greatest for middle and upper income households since the tax savings from home ownership tend to increase with income. Now, these restrictions on black access to home ownership may explain why Negro households at every income level have less wealth than white households. The average wealth of black households in 1966, and by wealth we mean assets minus liabilities, was $4,000, and contrasted to an average ownership of wealth for white Americans of $20,000, one-fifth as large. Now, in part, this difference reflects the lower current and past incomes of black households. But if you examine the estimates, the same kinds of data by income class, it turns out that the finding holds by income class as well. Because even after you control for, for income, black households are much less likely, have much less wealth than white households of the same income level. Now, a simple example can illustrate the substantial effect that home ownership can have on capital accumulation by low- and middle-income households. The average house purchased with an FHA 203 mortgage in 1949 had a mean value of $8,300. And typically, the, uh, the, the purchaser would take out a mortgage of about $7,100. You had to make about $1,000 down payment on this $8,000 house. Now, if this house had been purchased with a 20-year mortgage by a 30-year-old household head, and if the home neither appreciated or depreciated, as if there was no increase or decrease in the price level for that home, the purchaser would have saved $7,000 and would have owned his home free and clear by its 50th birthday. Moreover, if we assume that the price of this single-family single home increased by a conservative 2.5% a year, which for those of you who know anything about the post-war uh, increase in housing prices would recognize as being conservative, the purchaser would have accumulated assets by age 50 worth at least $16,000. 
a considerable sum that, could be, could, that he could use to reduce his housing costs, to borrow against for the college education of his children, or simply to hold for his retirement. And if you keep in mind, that's almost exactly the difference between the average black wealth and the average white wealth. Average white wealth, $20,000. Average uh, black wealth, $4,000. The example I've just told you, $16,000 in, in wealth savings uh, over this 20-year period. There's no question that lower and middle-income white households in America have accumulated a large part of their wealth in the form of appreciation of owner-occupied units. By far the most important method of saving uh, available uh, to uh, low and middle income households. The full effects of housing market discrimination then far, extend far beyond housing, include additional more subtle costs and welfare losses for the black population. Segregated housing patterns create unequal educational opportunity, increase insurance and other living costs, and, and, and contribute to employment discrimination for blacks. De facto segregation rooted in racial discrimination in urban housing markets has placed de jure segregation as a principal cause of segregated education and the inferior quality it all too often signifies. Again, it is the middle class and upward mobile blacks who wish their children to have the best education possible who suffer most from existing patterns of segregated education. Blacks who buy homes in the ghetto either are forced to pay more for theft and fire insurance than the cost they would incur in suburban communities, or they're unable to obtain insurance coverage at all. Mortgage financing, moreover, is di more difficult to obtain and can often be obtained only on less favorable terms than in the suburbs. These premiums are in addition to the discrimination markups and the limitations on home ownership that I've discussed previously. Ghetto residents, moreover, usually must pay more for auto insurance than suburban whites. Housing segregation and discrimination reinforce more direct forms of employment discrimination. Geographic limitations on the residential choice of non-whites ensure that blacks can reach many kinds of jobs only by making time-consuming and expensive commutes. If blacks seek, obtain, and accept these distant jobs, their real wages, by that we mean the money wages minus the money and time outlays for commuting, will be far less than those of comparable white workers. Often they will not even learn of available jobs far from the ghetto or will not bother to apply because of the cost and difficulty of reaching them. Faced with these difficulties, they may accept low paying jobs near the ghetto or no job at all, choosing leisure and welfare as rational alternatives to low pay and poor working conditions. Now, the preceding discussion makes it clear that progress in improving the welfare of black Americans depends critically on providing them with access to the entire metropolitan housing market on the same basis as whites. To accomplish this objective, a number of economists have proposed the use of payments to encourage whites to move into predominantly black neighborhoods and to encourage blacks to move into all of predominantly white neighborhoods. The size of these payments would be scaled to the degree of integration existing in the neighborhood. No payments would be provided to blacks who choose to live in all black neighborhoods or to whites choosing all white neighborhoods. Now, all those simple incentives of this kind are hard to found, fault on grounds of narrow economic efficiency. They, of course, have little chance of gaining public acceptance. Still, a number of more modest schemes in the spirit of these proposals might be accepted by the public particularly if the public were aware of the full cost of existing patterns of racial discrimination. In principle, a housing allowance could be a nearly ideal instrument to achieve an orderly reduction in the geographic isolation of black Americans. The allowances could be structured to encourage greater racial and economic integration, and more importantly, to discourage the intense concentration of black and poverty populations that produce unfavorable neighborhood effects in urban housing markets. Specifically, allowances could be scaled to the social and economic concentration of particular neighborhoods, or quotas could be employed. In the first instance, housing allowance recipients would be given larger allowances for housing in neighborhoods 
where there are few housing allowance recipients currently residing. A quota system might operate with a uniform allowance, but refuse to approve units in neighborhoods once the number of recipients reaches a certain prescribed level. Quotas and sliding subsidy scales might be justified as a way to spread the burden of dealing with the problems of these disadvantaged populations. To ensure that no community or neighborhood is forced to accept a disproportionate number of disadvantaged households and to mini minimize the likelihood of adverse neighborhood effects. Now HUD is currently engaged in a large scale program of housing allowance experiments. Most of you probably have heard, for example, of the supply experiments being conducted in South Bend or in St. Joseph County. Although HUD, HUD officials obviously hope that a housing allowance program would reduce racial discrimination somewhat, they, to my knowledge, have given no consideration to explicitly using the program in the manner that I've described. In fact, they appear to be concerned that fears of too rapid a dispersal of the black population might provoke opposition to the proposal. A housing allowance program could also provide attractive opportunities to aid minority households in locating housing outside the ghetto and to monitor, monitor the activities of lenders, builders, and housing suppliers. The success of such measures, of course, depends on adequate and sympathetic staffing and a high level of support for the aims of the program. Extreme care would have to be taken to ensure that these information and counseling programs did not have do not operate in precisely the opposite way. That is to discourage black households for searching, for, from searching for housing outside the ghetto and to channel them into the ghetto housing supply. The overwhelming evidence that discrimination reduces the opportunities of black households to be homeowners provides a powerful rationale for a special minority mortgage loan program. At minimum, the large impact of this impairment on Negro housing costs and then the ability of black households to save and accumulate wealth justifies a special effort to ensure that the mortgage applications of black households re receive sympathetic review under existing programs, regardless of the locations of the properties concerned. It is crucial in addition that these programs give full credit to the earnings of black females in the assessment of the financial strength of potential black buyer borrowers. Female earnings are, of course, a far more important for, for black households than for white households. The effectiveness, of, the effectiveness of both existing programs and any special minority mortgage loan program would be appreciably diminished by the limited supply of suitable housing in existing black neighborhoods. Therefore, blacks wishing to buy properties outside of established minority concentrations should be assured that these mortgage applications receive rapid and sympathetic review under, the, under existing programs. In addition, it would be desirable to develop legislation that would enable FHA to give more favorable terms, lower interest rates, smaller down payments, and longer terms to minority households purchasing properties in areas distant from the ghetto. Negro households are obviously a large potential market for home ownership. As Negro incomes continue to increase, this potential, in, this potential demand will grow. It's well to emphasize, however, that these higher levels of home ownership will not be realized unless Negro households gain access to a supply of suitable housing. A combination of favorable terms, good service, and aggressive marketing by FHA would be a powerful force to loosen the barriers to Negro entry into middle and higher income neighborhoods. Such policies would enable black households to obtain the higher quality housing, which existing patterns of discrimination and segregation now appear to prevent them from consuming. A minority mortgage loan program would help redress the effects of earlier FHA policies that made it difficult or impossible for minorities to acquire housing in white residential areas. Policies that were among the most effective instruments for maintaining, maintaining segregated living patterns. A minority mortgage loan program should be designed to reduce the pressure on transitional neighborhoods in the path of ghetto expansion rather than to exacerbate it. At minimum, it should be neutral in terms of residential location. Preferably, it should encourage minority households to seek housing in predominantly white, middle, and upper income neighborhoods 
distant from existing minority concentrations. Government price guarantees for properties located in the path of ghetto expansion should also be considered. It's widely believed that racial integration causes property values to decline. Although this belief would appear to be inconsistent with the evidence that housing prices and rents are higher in the ghetto than outside, a number of studies in the, of the trends in housing prices in transitional neighborhoods have, exist, have identified a pattern of short-run price movement that may explain this apparent contradiction. White demand for properties in threatened neighborhoods may suddenly fall off in anticipation of their transition to Negro occupancy. Although prices are eventually reestablished at an even higher level, they may reach quite low levels during the hiatus between white flight and large-scale black entry. Owners who panic and sell their properties during this period may suffer large capital losses. Even a few experiences of this kind no matter how atypical, may be sufficient to perpetuate white fears about the effects of integration on the value of their properties. If a program could be designed to support prices during critical periods in transitional neighborhoods, it would remove a source of racial hostility, inhibit panic selling, perhaps help stabilize neighborhoods in the path of ghetto expansion. Admittedly, it would be difficult to design a program of this kind because of the complexity of urban housing markets the difficulty of disentangling the short-run dynamics accompanying racial integration from longer-run influences on housing markets. Even so, the feasibility of such a program should be investigated. Extreme care should be taken, however, to ensure that such a program does not encourage more rapid transition of transitional neighborhoods. Black Americans today remain intensely segregated in U.S. metropolitan areas. Still, there are some indications that growing numbers of black households are moving to the suburbs. A full evaluation of these changes and their implications must wait more detailed analysis based on more uh, substantial information. But the limited evidence available suggests that the forces of housing market discrimination in a number of metropolitan areas may be waning. At the same time, other metropolitan areas, particularly those in the South, may be becoming more segregated. Historically, southern metropolitan areas, particularly the older ones, did not exhibit the massive concentration of black households which characterized northern metropolitan areas. Unfortunately, they appear to be developing patterns of racial segregation that are similar to those found in the North. Qualitative changes in recent decades and the nature of the forces that maintain and support housing market segregation provide even more basis for optimism. A few years ago, the government actively supported and maintained segregated living patterns. The most effective weapons to maintain segregation, for example, racial government covenants and FHA mortgage loan policies, have been struck down by the courts or eliminated through legislative or executive action. Racial discrimination in how urban housing markets is now unlawful, and the federal government and numerous state and local governments have promulgated a number of important regulations that would limit the ability of lenders, brokers, sellers, property owners, and developers to discriminate against minorities. These changes in law and government policy and practice reflect long-term trends in the attitudes of the American population towards racial discrimination. Whereas a short time ago, an individual who would openly discriminate in housing could expect strong and vocal approval from his friends and neighbors, today he will often feel obliged to hide his actions or his motives. Brokers who once openly refused to serve blacks must now disguise their discriminatory actions. Because of changes in law and community attitudes, brokers are increasingly willing to show them property in white neighborhoods to black households. Unfortunately, at the same time, there are encouraging signs that the barriers to blacks seeking out housing outside the ghetto are somewhat less. Many black leaders and intellectuals appear to have lost their zest for integration as a goal. Increasing numbers of individual black households are finding their way out of the ghetto, but they do so in general without the active support of black leaders and intellectuals. Indeed, in some instances, they encounter hostility from the black community 
for their efforts to obtain a better life for themselves and their families. This attitude, if it persists, will retard the progress of both individually, both individual upward mobile black households and the black population as a whole. The recent lack of enthusiasm for or antagonism towards racial integration reflects, as I've indicated, a flirtation with black separatism and black economic development. In my judgment, economic and political separatism is not a viable strategy to achieve rapid improvements in black welfare. This is not to say that a number of specific proposals advanced in the name of ghetto or economic development may not be valuable. But for the reasons I've identified tonight, I continue to believe that the best and perhaps the only way to obtain a quality of opportunity and achievement for black Americans is through the elimination of discriminatory practices, and particularly in housing. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to uh, respond to questions, but first I wanted to give you, I wanted to make a brief uh, 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 advertisement. Uh, as you, uh, as Dave uh, Johnson indicated, I'm chairman of Harvard's Department of City Regional Planning. And tomorrow, I'll be at the Career Placement Office. I'm not sure exactly uh, what, the what the title of that office is, uh, uh, here at Ball State, to uh, describe our program and urban planning policy analysis administration, uh, in particular to uh, undergraduates or other young people who are interested in the two-year uh, professional program leading to various kinds of jobs and so on in the public sector. Uh, and those of you who would like to learn more about this program, I'll be there, I believe, starting at uh, 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Oh, I'm not sure. You can find out by calling the placement office. Brief advertisement. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Yes. Well, I'm not sure I quite understand the question. I mean, the, as I read the history, uh, the period of the 60s was one in which black intellectuals, uh, uh, black community leaders, uh, uh, white liberals and so on, all agreed that uh, integration into the wider society was, was, was not only desirable but essential to the eventual achievement of uh, equality of opportunity for blacks. Uh, during the 60s then, and particularly associated with the, at about the time of the riots and so on, you, you basically had blacks, uh, black intellectuals, black community leaders, who basically started, who kind of got sick and tired of what uh, many instances they saw of lack of progress uh, in that strategy, uh, and who turned themselves, uh, turned really to these alternative strategies, an idea of instead of trying to integrate into the larger society, try to build strength, uh, political power, economic power, and so on within the ghetto. Uh, and what I'm suggesting is that that's a mistake. That was a mistake at the time. It's a mistake uh, at the present time. That the, the interdependence and in nature of the metropolitan, the urban society in which we live uh, are, is such uh, that uh, blacks will always be seriously disadvantaged uh, and uh, will be suffering under very, very severe burdens if they accept this kind of segregated society, particularly segregation in housing, uh, if they accept that. And that, that, you know, as attractive, as much appeal as some of those ideas have, they're just, just not going to really work. Uh, and that's, that's the basic argument. Uh, uh, and uh, the, uh, I mean, I'm not sure that's responsive to your question. It's sort of restating the, the point I have, but it was because I didn't really quite understand uh, your question. Excuse me? 
Now, what I'm simply suggesting is we ought to try to achieve a situation in society where the black population essentially has the opportunities of the rest of the population and where you have essentially the kinds of patterns of residential concentration and location you find for any other identifiable group within our society, which means some clustering, that is, there are Italian neighborhoods in Boston and there are Polish neighborhoods in, in Cleveland and there are uh, Jewish neighborhoods in Boston. Uh, I live three blocks from the temple and it turns out that there's lots of Jews who live close by the temple and so our neighborhood is sort of more than average Jewish and that's sort of not a, anything to be concerned about. It's a matter of free choice. It's probably a kind of desirable feature of, a, of our society, uh, but that's not the situation of blacks. Blacks live in intensely concentrated uh, uh, ghettos. Uh, they live there out of largely involuntarily. It's not a question of free choice. It can't be explained by sort of economic or, or differences in the family structure or any of those kinds of things. It, 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 it's just a very different kind of, of thing, and it imposes huge costs on blacks, and it also imposes huge costs on the, the majority population. I didn't particularly talk about those tonight, but there are, in fact, large efficiency losses to the society as large that arises from the particular patterns of segregation and discrimination that exist in our cities. Uh, and I think that... that that it's, it's, it's in many respects those aspects, the, the distortions that racial discrimination uh, uh, creates uh, for metropolitan development that probably should be, you know, professionally, you might say, of most interest to uh, urban planners, uh, designers, and the like, because the, the principal thing that's uh, fallen up our cities, our metropolitan areas, is the, the, the indirect effects of, uh, of racial discrimination. Yeah. Well, first place, yeah. Well, I think, you know, the, the, you have to ask the same question, what happens to the desperate lives of the low-income whites uh, who are left behind? This is a question as to how, how you achieve upward mobility in our society. And uh, what I'm arguing or suggesting to you is that you achieve upward mobility in society by providing some kind of equality of opportunity. Uh, and that's not to say that, that we shouldn't do things to assist low-income blacks just as we should do things to assist low-income whites. We ought to, to have policies that encourage uh, low-income whites and low-income blacks to be productive in our society, that ensure that they have a kind of decent uh, uh, standard of living, uh, but that's quite separate from the issue as to how we provide uh, blacks with opportunities in this society and how we achieve some kind, how we, let, how we get them to break out of the uh, uh, the kind of uh, situation that they're presently in. Why don't we why don't we why don't we make that argument about low income whites? Is why don't we say that that high income whites should have to live in neighborhoods? cheek by jowl uh, with, uh, with, with, with the lowest income, most disadvantaged parts of the white population, that they should have to attend the, the inadequate inferior schools that those low income white. We don't make that argument. Why do we treat blacks any differently in this respect? What is the engine by which you achieve upward mobility in the society? So don't confuse the question of dealing with the disadvantages with the black population but providing the black population with opportunities. And the point is that, that the way you provide them with opportunities is see they have a chance to make it. And they are so disadvantaged by the limitations imposed by racial discrimination that they can't, uh, uh, the, the low-income black can't buy his home. He doesn't have the opportunity that you and your parents had to accumulate a small nest egg uh, 
which could be used for your college education, could be used for their old age, could be used to start a small business. The direct effects of the limitations on residential choice are to provide them, to prevent them from having that kind of opportunity for the accumulation of wealth and to have that opportunity for the accumulation of, of assets. If you're a working class white and you want to get a superior education for your kid, you can move to the, and, and send your kid at a very modest premium to the same school that my kid goes to. If you're black, a middle income black, if you, you may be able to do that, but it takes a lot of guts, a lot of persistence, and a lot of hassle. And that's, uh, and, and it, in my community, it's a rather good place in that respect. It's more possible there than most other places. And that's the kind of, of that point is that, that, that racial discrimination truncates the opportunities for middle and lower income blacks and, and makes it difficult for them to essentially live. That, that's a way to get a process of upward mobility working. Yeah. Right, right. No, I no, no what, I, what I'm a proponent of is suburbanization of blacks. It's, it's an entirely question, different question as to what pop, proportion of the population should live in suburban areas and what proportion should live in central cities. But why should blacks be prohibited from living in suburban areas? Why should only whites have the opportunity to live in the suburbs? Uh, that's, that's the issue. It's not whether you have more or less suburbanization. It's, it's, it's to provide the same opportunities to blacks as whites have available to them. That's right. That's a, that's a different issue. I mean, it's not, that's one which, uh, you know, uh, it, it's one that framed in that way I don't have any answers to. It's one we could talk about, you know, if we wanted to. But it's, I, I'm not sort of proposing more suburbanization. I'm saying let's give the blacks the same opportunities that whites have. The suburban areas, suburban places are better places for, for whites to bring up their kids, and you might want to argue about that. Uh, then why shouldn't blacks be able to bring their kids up there? Some of the whites can move back into the city. I mean, you know, the, the mechanism is that whites, in some sense, uh, are forced out of central cities by the growing uh, black uh, low income population. A lot of the central city decay clearly has to do with the, uh, the intense concentration, the kinds of dynamics that are produced by the particular patterns of segregation we have in American cities. Uh, if you want to save central cities, uh, provide blacks opportunities to live somewhere else. And that's 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 the first. Uh, that's exactly the first piece of advice I give you. Right. I I live in the suburbs. I live in the suburbs. All right. Half of the 40% of the housing stock in the town I live in is multifamily. It's well within the reach of middle income, lower income black households. It's where the, the white ethnics in our uh, community have gotten their foothold. There's lots of two family houses that white ethnics buy, uh, accumulate wealth, use for their families, and so on. It's exactly that kind of mechanism, that kind of machinery of progress that this limitation on residential choice uh, is ahead. Uh, the notion that the suburbs are where all the rich people live and the central city is where all the poor people live is a bunch of nonsense. I told you the statistics in Detroit. 50% uh, of, the, of the poor people in, in, in Detroit live in the suburbs. Poor whites. It's just the low, poor, poor blacks who don't live there. I mean, that's... That, that's I mean, don't, don't, don't fall into the trap of sort of thinking about the suburbs as where all the rich people live and nothing but high income, high, high cost housing, and central cities where all the poor people live and nothing but low cost housing. It's not like that at all. But central cities typically more expensive for the same quality of housing. 
it's, 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 you know, it's, it's the way the world is. Yeah. No, what I'm saying, in fact, I would say that if you don't do anything about discrimination, that uh, it's going to operate just like it does now. If you don't do anything about discrimination, blacks are going to not get as much out of the housing allowance as whites do, because blacks have such a restricted supply of housing available to them. And if you don't do something to increase the supply of housing, particularly to, con to increase the desirable supply of desirable kinds of housing, that you're, not, you're going to have some effect, you're going to benefit blacks to some extent, but you're not going to benefit them nearly as much uh, uh, as whites. So if you're, in fact, going to, uh, uh, to, to have a housing allowance, you sure as heck had better worry about uh, ways to increase the supply of housing for blacks. One way to do that is to, uh, uh, is to suburbanize the blacks, uh, or provide them with suburban house, housing opportunities or housing opportunities outside of the black area. The other way to do it is to generate some mechanism that rapidly accelerates the, uh, the expansion of the ghetto, creates a very rapid peripheral expansion. That's, either of those could do it. Uh, I think there are large efficiency losses from continual peripheral expansion of these sort of massive central city ghettos. That's the, yeah. Excuse me, I, I can't hear you. No, what I'm saying is that, that when you have... Well, let me, let me pick up. First point, what I'm saying is that if you ask an economist, what would you do about housing market discrimination? They'll sit down and they'll look at it a little bit and they'll say, bribes. They'll say, bribes. You'd bribe the whites to move into black neighborhoods, and you'd bribe the blacks to move into white neighborhoods. Incentives, subsidies, if you want nicer words, but bribes. Uh, and uh, that's what they'd say. Now, you'd, they, they, if they had any kind of practical streak in them at all, they'd say, well, you know, people aren't going to quite buy that in that blunt a way. But maybe we can find some programs that do give incentives to black households to overcome the sort of the, the natural inertia, the disadvantages and so on that exist uh, in, the, uh, uh, in, in the, the housing market. The way you avoid white flight, see white flight only takes place in areas where whites are absolutely convinced they're going to become all black. And that's right on the periphery of the ghetto. I mean, you know, you, 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 uh, you, you talk to anybody in any northern city in the United States. Start talking to them about the uh, about where the blacks live and so on, and they'll start telling you, well, the blacks are moving towards Rudisil Boulevard, or they're moving down. They're now at such and such a street, and they're moving it. You know, in fact, people in Chicago have sort of worked out charts, and they will tell you what day a certain block will change. Uh, and so, you know, it's expectations. Whites believe. In fact, they know that as long as, as, as the as, as housing market discrimination works in the way it does now, that if they, are, if they own a home in the path of that ghetto, just a matter of time before that neighborhood is not integrated, but all black. Now, the question is, how do you, how do you deal with that problem? The way you deal with it is by removing the, the, the pressure, the excess demand on the periphery of the ghetto, and you do it by essentially providing lots of, of, of opportunities in widely scattered areas. As, you know, if, if, if there are a few blacks who move into every neighborhood, nobody worries about the neighborhood becoming all black. It's only you know, certain areas with clear historical precedent and where there's tremendous pent-up demand. Nobody's worried about my town becoming all black because there are, you know, 10 black households in it. They don't even worry if it's, there's an 11th one uh, because, in fact, there is just no immediate plot, realistic threat of... Uh, you loan everywhere they want to go. I mean, you, just say, you say, we loan to you 
in uh, basically any white neighborhood that you want. Now, what you know, there may, there is, there will be some tendency. There will be some tendency for some clustering. But in fact, if you do it in enough communities, you do it in enough places, uh, you have no real credible threat uh, for uh, the areas to, to use the terminology to tip. Pardon? No, because we don't have any such program. How can I have an example of that? We've had all. I can cite you examples in Westchester County of areas that are essentially outside of the uh, uh, of the area of sort of major black expansion, where there doesn't seem to be any pressure. Uh, where the same kinds of dynamics don't seem to work. That is, is, I described this pattern where on the south side of Chicago, and I suspect on the south side of Fort Wayne, uh, if, if basically where everybody expects the neighborhood to change, what happens is a few months before it actually happens, whites begin to, to conclude that's going to happen. They stop buying in that area. So you have a period when prices really soften in those neighborhoods, uh, and that makes that area very attractive, uh, uh, even more attractive than otherwise would be for, uh, for blacks to buy. It reduces the resistance of the existing whites to sell because they basically sell the blacks because they basically don't have any white buyers. Uh, and the process works in a dynamic way. There are, there are areas where blacks have moved, uh, typically higher or middle income blacks, some distance from the ghetto where there have been some growth in the black population without any setting off this kind of dynamic, without, uh, without creating this kind of effect. And if you do that in enough places, and if you do it in enough places through purposeful public policy, uh, then you, in fact, uh, just not in that, the big thing to remember is that blacks are a minority. You know, if you spread blacks around, there aren't enough of them to, uh, to, to make every neighborhood black. There's only enough of them to make every neighborhood about 15% black. And if you then say there's some natural propensity for blacks, just like other people, to sort of cluster some, to some extent, you, most neighborhoods have 5, 6, 7% black. Some of them have 30% black. But you don't have any 100% black neighborhoods. And particularly, you don't have block after block after block of nothing but black blocks, and then block after block after block of nothing but white blocks, which is the existing pattern. Yeah. There, 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 there was a period, uh, there still to some extent is a period, when blacks were very much intrigued by the idea of sort of massing and creating political power. I think that there's some feeling that that's not uh, an immediately viable strategy any longer. I think there's also some examples where blacks have managed to achieve a significant political power in other ways. I mean, we have a black senator from Massachusetts, remember? He wasn't elected by any... Uh, 80% black population. Uh, it was elected by 7% black population, or something like that, and a lot of whites. Uh, and uh, you know, it, the, the, you know, you just have to break out of the mold of the kind of peculiar institutions that we've created by this uh, uh, particular set of discriminatory practices we have. Yeah. Well, they, they did it under court order. I mean, you know, and, uh, uh, the, that's important to keep in mind. Uh, the, uh, the, the sort of battle is still going on. And one of the interesting things about all of this, this sort of discrimination story and so on is that we, we of course, have not exactly had vigorous executive action in this area for the last uh, four years. Uh, we haven't even had terribly vigorous congressional support for these kinds of programs. The one institution that keeps grinding away is the courts. And the courts keep knocking down uh, the uh, uh, various kinds of discriminatory practices. So in Hartford, uh, 
We've just had uh, a, uh, some, some HUD programs join uh, for, to, that would give community block funds to suburban areas because suburban areas were clearly following policies uh, if, if probably to exclude, if not to encourage uh, black households to live in their environment. So there's a lot of sort of flux in this area. The courts are kind of churning away. Uh, the long run, uh, partially due to uh, changes in the attitudes of whites. I mean, I think it's clear that if you look at, at, at say, any long-term evidence on, or any attitudinal studies on whites dealing with prejudice and so on, you find a couple things. One thing you find is that uh, the willingness of whites to support various kinds of discriminatory acts has been declining over time for quite a long time, from ever since, say, 1940 or so, when you started having polls like the, like, uh, the Roper poll and so on, asking questions about discrimination. A second thing that happens in these, in, in these polls is that younger people invariably are less prejudiced less willing to discriminate, less willing to tolerate discriminatory practices than older people. That's part of the dynamic that we're really talking about. My kids are much less prejudiced than I am. I mean, there's just no doubt about it. I mean, I have sort of lots of innate prejudices, probably, that sort of I got when I grew up in uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana, uh, when the black kid who played on our uh, uh, sort of all-star basketball team couldn't be uh, served in Evansville, Indiana. With, at the restaurant we went to. I mean, they're, they're, we have those kinds of experiences. My kids are, are a different, uh, different generation. So that's one thing. There's clear evidence of a secular decline. There's clear evidence that, uh, that younger, better educated people are less discriminating, less prejudiced. The other thing, of course, is the growing black political power. An awful lot of the progress that has come uh, from uh, the, uh, to blacks over the last 30 or 40 years is due to the fact that they've moved uh, from uh, the south to the north, where they, in fact, turn out to be increasingly the swing group uh, in the sort of democratic coalition. Uh, and they delivered a lot of elections uh, to the Democrats. And they didn't do it because they were you know, all concentrated in a few neighborhoods. They did it because they were a group uh, that had a strong uh, uh, commitment in a few key states and presidential elections. It was the presidential elections that gave blacks the, some political clout. That's the reason for a lot of the changes that we've had. Uh, so I, I think those are some of the, the points. Yeah? You mentioned uh, a form of subsidy at a national level. Do you have any suggestions as to local uh, policy Well, I'm pretty old-fashioned about a lot of these things. I still think fair housing committees are a good thing. They have pretty much lost their sense of purpose and went out of business during this period that I talked about. It became uh, unpopular for white liberals to, uh, uh, to support uh, fair housing co committees in local communities and so on, uh, not because, in some sense, there was any great change in the attitudes of the whites in those communities, but because the, the, you know, they were continually being beat around the ears for, by this sort of black power rhetoric and so on. It got out of fashion. I think they're still a wonderful idea. Uh, you know, they, it's that kind of, uh, of, uh, of uh, sort of you know, community support and so on that can make a real difference in the community. So our, 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 our fair housing committee in Belmont uh, uh, sort of basically went out of business about uh, five or six years ago. Uh, and uh, I think it's all, to, you know, it'd be a nice thing if it came back again. There's still a lot of things it could do. Yeah. Uh, I voted absentee last, uh, before I came out to Indiana, and I voted the Carter Mondale ticket. Uh, and much of the reason I did it had to do with my view towards uh, their urban policy, the, the, the attitude they're likely to take about these kinds of issues and so on, uh, as well as the, uh, 
extent to which they would, in fact, try to uh, expand the economy rather than operating more cautiously to it. General economic expansion and uh, in providing opportunities for blacks to obtain housing outside the ghetto would be the two most powerful mechanisms that I can think of to improve the condition and improve the opportunities of the city. Yeah. Well, I think the reason probably I think the reason probably has to do with the fact that this is a is a difficult policy agenda to raise in the national scene. Let me tell you a story about how I caused uh, Gene McCarthy's defeat for the presidency. All right, uh, the uh, it's uh, it, it's been alleged uh, on by one of uh, Gene McCarthy's policy advisors, one of the people who really sort of bankrolled his campaign and was a real McCarthy advisor. Uh, that McCarthy, during, before his uh, election campaign, uh, and before, say, the California debate between uh, Robert Kennedy and himself, uh, read a paper which myself and a colleague of mine wrote, something called Alternatives to the Gilded Ghetto, which basically laid out a lot of these arguments only in a less detailed sort of way. It didn't have the benefit of a lot of the research on housing market discrimination that I've described tonight, but had a lot of the basic, had the basic thrust to the sort of, you might say, the intellectual argument. Uh, and it, the, the, the story is that Eugene McCarthy read that and said, that guy's right, right? And that's the way we ought to, that's what our policy should be. Uh, most of you probably don't remember the California debate. I remember it very clearly. Uh, during the California debate, Robert Kennedy said, to, and Robert Kennedy basically was the, uh, the, the alternative to the Gilded Ghetto paper, which we wrote, article we wrote, was to some extent a kind of an attack on a, on a Robert Kennedy job creation bill to create jobs in the ghetto. That was sort of, to some extent, what the, the, what the debate was about, what the paper was about. In, in the California debate on, uh, on statewide television the day before the California primary, uh, Robert Kennedy asked uh, Eugene McCarthy, he said, you mean you plan to move a million blacks into Orange County? And Eugene McCarthy sort of said, well, I guess that's about right. And McCarthy lost California. Now, as a result, when I was asked to write a position paper for Jimmy Carter, I decided I'd just better keep my mouth shut. Uh, but that I, it looks to me like uh, Jimmy Carter wins, he owes more to the blacks for his election than Ford will if he's win. And we've seen uh, basically how responsive uh, uh, Ford and the Republican Party is to the interests of blacks uh, over the last four years. I think there's a lot of evidence that regardless of what the specifics of that debate are, there's no kidding around. You know, most people know how they come out on that particular issue. It's like abortion. It's the kind of thing people don't want to talk about in political campaigns. It's a no-win issue in a political campaign and it, it's, a, it's a very high risk strategy to, in fact, present a kind of argument of the kind I do, if I talk to you about tonight, because the kind of argument I've talked about tonight doesn't make a good one minute uh, TV spot. Uh, we've been here quite a while tonight, and uh, I have probably haven't convinced all of you yet uh, what I have to say is right. Yeah. Any other? Uh, yes. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to know what the effect of any particular, you know, federal housing program is. Uh, I think it's pretty hard to, uh, I mean, to, to uh, my impression, and I'm not an expert on, say, the urban house, on, on the homesteading program. My impression is that that was a program that never made very much sense and never really went anywhere. Uh, and uh, I, I think my general sense is that uh, as long as we have discriminatory housing markets, 
there's not a great deal that you can do uh, to significantly improve uh, the, uh, the housing condition of black households. I mean, you give them money, most of it's going to be dissipated uh, through uh, 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 various kinds of, uh, of limitations on their choice. I, I just don't think it's likely to be very effective. I think I might say, I think this is the linchpin. And, uh, uh, you know, I think you have to find ways uh, that, uh, that essentially allows blacks greater choice, greater opportunity in housing. As long as you work within that constrained, limited situation, anything you do to improve the housing condition of blacks, you're not going to be successful or incredibly expensive. Uh, and, uh, you know, we just aren't ready to, you know, that incredibly expensive thing, we just aren't willing to pay enough yet uh, to, uh, to sub substantially improve the welfare of blacks through that strategy. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think there are two things. First, I don't really know that there is a housing shortage. I mean, I, I, I don't, you know, there, there may be one emerging because we haven't done any building for a while, but it was pretty clear that uh, we probably overbuilt given the existing level of aggregate demand for housing, given the existing income district, we probably overbuilt five years ago. And if you may not, it wasn't too long ago when people were talking about abandonment. Abandonment really indicated that rather than being a shortage, it was a surplus of housing at the existing income distribution. Uh, but I don't know whether there is a shortage, that's to begin with. Now, my own feeling is if you get the legislation, that in fact uh, you could, you know, have a real impact on the residential choices of uh, white and black households through various kinds of subsidy schemes. Uh, and that there's a lot you could do in this area. And that the, and the climate for, for change in this area is much more favorable. I mean, I think. The one thing I'd really like to leave with you is that it's a new ball game. It's not like it was 20 years ago. The, the sort of glue that holds together racial discrimination in the urban housing market is just a lot less strong. That the, There just are not the kinds of powerful, effective tools for maintaining segregation and discrimination that there were 20 years ago. So that, you know, a fairly kind of modest tilt in policy and, you know, the decision on the fact of black Americans that this is the way to go, I think could make a rapid change in the uh, extent of discrimination and segregation in our society. I mean, it's, it's a new ball game. The opportunity is there. It's not going to happen without, the, without that little push, though. It's not going to happen without a commitment on the part of whites and blacks alone that this is the best thing for society as a whole. It's the best thing for blacks. It's the best thing for the white society. You get that, and you get some federal policy and maybe some state and local policy pushing that way. It's a lot easier than it used to be. It's a completely different, uh, different ball game. You've got to be really sneaky to discriminate successfully today. It used to be you could sort of, you know, set yourself up your own, you know, association of realtors and just get together and decide how to carve up the city, and uh, it was all okay. You can go to jail doing that today. The Justice Department doesn't fool around. They, they, they don't think that's fun. Oh, yeah, they certainly are. Right. And there's also a lot of blacks who don't realize that there's more of an opportunity there. They've had, you know, 100 years to learn the lesson that you can't move into white neighborhoods. That's a tough lesson to unlearn. It's a lot less true than it was 20 years ago. And it's a combination of them learning that, them being committed to breaking out of this pattern, and the, the, the assistance of, uh, of, of public policy to help overcome a lot of the inertia and real fears and costs of, of doing that. It could change rapidly. Yes, back there in the back. No, I said there are examples of integration. 
Westchester County, New York. There are areas in Westchester County that, a, that relatively large numbers of blacks have moved into that do not exhibit the kind of dynamics that you get on the south side of Chicago, that do not ex sort of show the kind of you know, effects on the housing market that, uh, that you do. That, that, that's, that tends to be somewhat of an, of an unusual situation. Oh, there's no question there's not as much prejudice as there was 20 years ago. I mean, I'm enough older than you to remember 20 years ago. Uh, I can even remember 30 years ago. There's no question. Uh, 30 years ago anywhere. 30 years ago in Fort Wayne, Indiana, where I grew up. You know, it's different. My children are different. Your children will be different yet. Yeah, there, there are people in Westchester pretty much like me. They all come from Indiana. <laughs> the, uh, it's, it's the same thing. Yeah. Thank you very right. much. Thank you. Thank you.